take your Bible this morning, if you would, and turn over to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You know, it's interesting, I make note of this, the Lord is always orchestrating things, but the uh, different sicknesses that would take place and so forth, um, Heather was not scheduled to sing this morning, we had to shift some things around, and I was almost chuckled to myself as she started the song of how directly it relates to what I'm going to be preaching on this morning. As a matter of fact, I wasn't going to read this as my text, but if you would look down to verse 18, which I'll get to before we're done, Lord willing, it says, but we all with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into his same image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of the Lord. That is, people see Jesus in us. And so the theme is there, and of course we'll uh, get to that point as we move along, but before we begin this morning to read the text, let's take a moment and have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning that we can be in this service. We know there's some folks that would like to be here that cannot, and Lord, some folks that are back that are glad they're maybe over some sickness, but Lord, we pray this morning you would remove those distractions, those hindrances, and allow the Word of God to have free course and to be glorified. There could be some that are exposed to the word this morning that do not personally know Jesus, and I pray you would show them their need. I pray every believer would be strengthened and helped. May we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in these moments, and we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll notice down in the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 3, without reading the entire passage, I want to bring your attention to verse 12, and you'll note that it begins with the word seeing. So obviously he's building the point here that he's making is built on the argument that he's offered in the previous verses, but he says, seeing then that these things are true, which we'll go back and look at, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Now, plain does not mean there in the idea of being easily understood as much as plain in that it has no frills, plain in the sense that it is bold, that it is audacious. What Paul is saying here is because our hope that we have, that he's established here, is so evident, it is so above argument, it is so much to the world that the world really can't comprehend it, that we step up a step above and we speak boldly about what we know to be true. You know, there's some things that we know from this book, and because God has spoken them, not because we ourselves or maybe more highly intelligent or not because we have some kind of an extra advantage but simply because we gain those truths from this book we speak them with authority and dogmatism you know the world claims and higher education especially emphasizes that there are no absolutes especially when it comes to the moral realm Um, I heard about a college student who was sitting one time in a class and The teacher started the class by saying, I want to begin this class with this principle, and this is going to help you out. And he said, put it in your notes, there are no absolutes. Well, the guy raised his hand in the back. He said, sir, you said that uh, uh, sort of quickly. Could Could you repeat that for me? And so he made the teacher emphasize it again. There are no absolutes I'm, I got most of that but the last couple of words could could you do that and of course the teacher got a little irritated didn't plus the guy can't write but as he began to speak he realized what the point was there are no he said okay there is one absolute and that is that there are no absolutes you know it's a ridiculous thing to say there are no absolutes because obviously there are now of course the world would believe and would have you believe that in the so-called scientific realm There is or are absolutes in that. That's because there's things they would like to maybe pursue. And, uh, of course, we've seen a little bit of the ludicrousy of of saying that all science, quote science, has absolutes because they continue to change directions and so forth. Uh, Obviously, we're always learning and there's new things. And there are certain principles of uh, knowledge and observation that would not change. But even in that realm, they're constantly learning new things and it's difficult to be dogmatic. But you know, when it comes to the realm of this book, there are some things today, because I have such great hope, that I can speak boldly about. That is, that I can speak with dogmatism. Do you know, all the way back in the very first book of the Bible, here is a man, Job, who was able to speak with dogmatism when he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. 
and that he shall stand at the last day upon the earth. It was the Apostle Paul who said in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You realize I know today, I am dogmatic, I have no reservation, I can say it not based on my authority or, again, my advantage, but simply because I know it has proven itself to be true, I have an infallible book. I have a book that has demonstrated itself to rise above men. Yes, it has been criticized. Yes, it's been attacked. There's any number of people that will say it's full of errors, that it's not going to come to fruition, but this book has proven itself again and again to be an infallible book that I can dogmatically affirm. But you know, this morning in a practical way, not just because I raise my voice or stomp my foot or just say, here's what I believe, <coughs> excuse me, but in a practical way, how does this great hope that we have demonstrate to the world that we have a right to be bold? Well, I want you to back up a little bit in this passage. In fact, you go back to the end of chapter 2. As you find your place there in chapter 2, I want you to notice, first of all, as it introduces chapter 3, how can I be dogmatic this morning? Well, because first of all, there is a marvelous manifestation. There is something that is manifested, that is going to be evident, that's going to be seen. It's not just theory. It's something that can be observed in a marvelous way that gives us this dogmatism. You know, notice, first of all, if you would, in chapter 2, he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, you know the word savor. It's not a word that we use all the time when we think of it in this way. We think of it maybe sometimes in a taste, but the idea here is a smell in the savor of his knowledge. People can detect it with their senses, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, to the other a savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things? You know, we find here that we have a triumph. It says, thanks be unto God that always causes us to triumph. This manifestation, in, in very simple terms, it is my testimony. It is what the world sees when they look at me, and I am representing the Lord Jesus Christ. As the song says, when they see Jesus in me, what are they seeing? They're seeing a person. The more I get out of the way and the more he shines through, it is going to impact them. You think about, if you would, the reminder in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's speaking there about those that have seen their dead one, uh, loved ones go on. He said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. We're familiar with the passage. We maybe hear it at a time of a funeral. But the second phrase says, for we sorrow not as others which have no hope. Do you realize when the world sees in me a hope they do not have, there is a magnificent, marvelous, a very definite manifestation, a savor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where did that hope come from? You see, our morals, our hope, our understanding of truth is superior to the world who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there's a very definite power that God gives as he lives through us. Now, it says, thanks be unto God that give us us to triumph. So what is the idea of this, this savor that is taking place? It, it may well be illustrated by back, and of course, when this was written, people would have been very familiar with this. When the Romans would go out and they would defeat a nation, they would often bring their captives back. And this, this didn't originate with the Romans. People have done this for years. But they would bring their captives back, and they would parade them through town, whether it would be to imprisoned or perhaps even to be tortured and killed. But their captives from the... Uh, battle and the conflict would come through and they would parade them as hey look at what we've done look at who we've defeated well the romans had a little um, way they like to do this they would bring them through and they would cause their captives to tote incense pots and of course that incense was just part of the ritual they would walk through holding these incense pots and it was uh, the aroma would go all through the town and so forth now on the one hand the people that were out watching and were cheering the roman soldiers that were on the side of rome they were excited and they would smell that savor and they think, oh boy, that's the smell of victory. Those that were toting the pots called it the smell of defeat. 
Now, he says, we have in us the savor of Christ. Do you know the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, over in verse 8, it says that when Jesus, who ascended up on high, led captivity captive. To lead captivity captive is that same analogy when God defeated the devil. When he was, had the nail put in the coffin, and he came out of the grave and demonstrated himself to be victorious. Jesus rose from the dead, defeated death, defeated hell. The devil knew he was a defeated foe, and through death destroyed him that had the power of death. God literally ascended up on high, and he led captivity captive. That is, he triumphed over his enemies. He put his spiritual enemies, the, the devil, the demons of hell. We couldn't see this take place, but God says he led captivity captive and demonstrated his power. Now, there is a great influence and power. It is the devil himself who pushes this world to do what it does. We have a system in which we live, and he is called the God of this present age or the God of this world. Now, he has been defeated by Christ, but of course, he's able to operate until Jesus finally comes back. But as he is operating, there is a system that goes opposed to what the believer has in his own heart. And do you know the world can't help but notice when Jesus begins to live out in us and begins to show the world who he is, there is a most marvelous manifestation that the world must recognize. See, there's a triumph. But it also differs in this as you move into chapter 3. There's a target. And the target differs. Why do men do what they do? I mean, yes, selfishly. But if a person wanted you to be impressed with their inability to make money, for instance, now they might enjoy the money itself and the things it can buy, but if they wanted to have some sense of ego, some sense of accomplishment, what good would success be if nobody was there to watch them have it? You know, it's kind of like going fishing. I don't mind catching a large bass, but it's a whole lot more fun if you've got somebody else you can brag about it with, right? Look what you didn't catch. How do you like that? Well, You know, it's just human nature. If I've done something successful, I want to show somebody what it is. But here is the difference that it follows the Word of God, which is always uh, God's ways are different than man's ways. When we are, quote, successful as a Christian, who is our success aimed at? The target is quite different. Look, if you would, in verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Now, there is a manward projection that is taking place, but who am I, first of all, trying to please? Paul says, I don't need to be commended by man. My target and my audience is God. He's the one I have to please. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, if I seek to please man, I should not be the servant of Christ. You see, when I first of all recognize that my testimony is first of all observed by the Lord himself, that my desire is to please him, it is not that I have a responsibility first and foremost to please man. I please God, and the byproduct of that is I am the epistle known and read of all men. Now, it's well been pointed out, certainly not original with me, that we are the only Bible some people are ever going to read. You see, we're the life that is exemplified, but who wrote it? We're not writing it ourselves. God is writing it through us. He's writing our life. He is demonstrating his power. He is making us what we are to be more like Jesus. And when we do that, we show the world something they wouldn't see otherwise. Yeah, they may not ever darken the door of a church, but they know when a Christian doesn't lose his temper like they do. They may not ever open up a Bible, but they know that when they would cuss and you don't, there's a difference. They know when they're immoral and you oppose that. Now listen, Christians are not perfect people. It's not that we don't fail. It's not that we don't come short. But it's how we view sin, that we don't defend it in our lives. We call it what it is. Yes, we admit weakness. We admit sometimes defeat. But we don't excuse it away. We call it sin and we seek to get it right. It's like the old blaspheming blacksmith. I'm sure I've shared this story before. He uh, just a terrible low-living guy, but he got saved. Well, all his friends were skeptical. Come on, uh, this blacksmith, he's one of the worst foul-mouthed guys I've ever seen. Constantly the guy with the dirty joke, can't hold his tongue. they just waiting on him to fail. I mean, he got really saved, and God was working in his heart. But, of course, he had to grow. And so he's trying his best to have a good testimony, trying to do right and 
do what he's supposed to, but his friends are constantly watching. One day he was out in his shop. None of his friends were in there, and he was, of course, a blacksmith, and he did something painful, probably hit his finger with a hammer or something, and uh, his immediate reaction, he just cursed out a blue streak. Man, a bunch of his friends, hey, did you hear him? They went in to mock him, and when they walked in the door, they got silent because he was down kneeling beside his bench. Oh, God, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, God, I know that was wrong. Listen, we fail, we err, but are we defending it? God wants to write an epistle through us to show this world that, yes, we're just forgiven sinners. We're sinners saved by grace, but God is doing something miraculous in our life. Now, there is a triumph through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a proper target. You say, but how in the world are we going to live that kind of testimony? I mean, boy, that's going to be difficult. I mean, this is a tough world. There's a lot of things we face. I just don't know how we could do it. Well, the Bible makes it pretty clear how to do it. He says in verse 4, Such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You see, without him, we can do nothing. You see, this manifestation that God is doing through us is simply God doing just that through us. It is the grace of God. It is incremental growth. It is not that immediately now, because I have been saved, that all of a sudden the world sees a perfect person that never errs, but they see a life that is headed in a new direction. They see a life that is motivated by different things. They see a life that take stands on things that are different than from the, what the world does. They see a confidence that I have in this book. They see the boldness of speech that, yes, I know I'm going to heaven, not because I'm good, not because I've lived a perfect life, not because I've earned it, but I'm going to heaven by the grace of God because God has saved me. Now, that manifestation is one of the reasons we could be bold. Somebody says, well, I'm afraid to speak up for Jesus because somebody knows my faults. Well, they may know your faults, but the thing is, the message is bigger than you are. Yeah, there's some faults, but the fact that you recognize them is a testimony to God. Now, this boldness that I have through the manifestation, it's followed up here if you'll keep reading, and you'll notice down with me as we move into this chapter in verse 6, we have, second of all, a miraculous ministration. Now, I'm using that word ministration because it's in this text, but if you'll notice in verse 6, it says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, what is the letter and what is the Spirit? You'll see from the context that the letter is speaking of the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments and all that surrounds it. The Spirit, of course, he says, made able ministers of the New Testament. This is the New Testament truth of the grace of God. Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now, it's an interesting uh, principle here that God uses the illustration of Moses. In fact, in verse 7, he goes on to say, For if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, we know what that was, the tablets, the Ten Commandments, and that was called the ministration of death. And I'll explain why. If that was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious or more so? For if the ministration of condemnation, that's the law, be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness, that's the gospel, exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. In other words, the gospel is so great that it almost causes all other glory of the law, what there was, to quell because the gospel is such a glorious thing. Now, anything God does, obviously, is perfect and right. God gave a law to his people. Let me remind you a little bit of the context, and I think it helps to understand that passage because in your, if you'll remember, first of all, God himself carved out two tables of stone. With his finger, he wrote the Ten Commandments on those tables. That was the initial law that Moses had. Actually, nothing else was given but those Ten Commandments. The people said, all that God has said we will do, and God gave those Ten Commandments. Now, remember, they, he gave it while Moses was 40 days up on a mountain. 
He was on that mountain and the people of Israel were down below waiting for Moses to get these words from God. God took his finger and wrote, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I'm supposed to be number one. Don't put any other god. Now that doesn't mean a graven god. It just meant anything you put before him, don't do it. And then the very next commandment, you shall have no graven image of any likeness of anything in the earth or the heaven, and you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Now before he got done with the other eight, do you know what the people below the mountain did? They violated that command. Now, what was God's response to the violation? You see, he said, here's my command. And they broke it before he could finish the rest of the table. He said, Moses, get out of the way. He said, move aside. I'm going to destroy the whole nation. Now, God obviously knew the end from the beginning. But he was simply speaking on the condemnation of that law. What did it require? They broke it. There's a punishment. No mercy. No grace. They broke the law. Moses, get out of the way, and I'm going to destroy the entire nation and start over with you. Now, Moses could have backed up. God could have destroyed that whole nation and talk about history, talk about eternity, whatever you want to do. If the story had gone and God destroyed the entire nation and Moses had a son and he started over and created a nation through Moses, who would have blamed him? They violated the word of God. See, the law without any mercy is a strict code. It is a code. God says, thou shalt not. You violate it. God judged. But Moses stepped up, as God knew he would, and he prayed. He said, oh God, these people deserve. They made them gods of gold. And do you remember one of the great places in the Bible? There's a dash. He says, God, they've made them gods of gold. and, And yes, they deserve to be judged. But if you will forgive their sin... He didn't really have anything to offer, so he said, if not, I pray thee, blot me out of the book which thou hast written. You know what God did in his mercy? He spared the children of Israel. Then he gives a second set of tablets. God, Moses broke the first one. They were just, the, Israel broke them, and God uh, had Moses just throw them off, and they were just destroyed because they trampled them. So he said, Moses, go back up, and I'm going to give you another set. He said, this time, you carve out the tables and I'll write it with my finger. Moses brought two tables up there, set them up, and God rewrote the exact same law, but this time he tempered it slightly with mercy because when he got through with the law, he didn't stop there. Exodus 34, you can go read the account from chapter 34 to chapter 40 are the instructions for the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a place where sacrifices would be offered. The tabernacle was the place where the holies of holy would be. Nobody could go there because he was going to explain that there had to be bloodshed. There had to be a sacrifice. How can these people have a law put in front of them? They're not going to keep it. They're just going to end up being destroyed. If Moses, he's not going to have to pray for them every time. So God says, I'm going to make a way. I'm going to be merciful to you and give you a sacrificial system. Well, you well know what that tabernacle points to. And you know what those sacrifices point to? They point to the Lord Jesus Christ. But imagine living for all of those years, and here's a law. If you commit adultery, you're stoned. You rebel against your parents, you're stoned. Uh, Your mule uh, or your ox goes out and gores somebody, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, a strict law. And for years they tried to live that law, and it proved them to something they could never do it. Let me tell you, if you try today to live the Ten Commandments, do the best you can, try to live an outstanding moral life, try not to sin when it comes up, try to make a right decision every time, you're going to find out the same thing those people thought or found out, that it was a ministration of death. Galatians 3.10, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. A preacher one time was speaking to a man about his soul. He said, sir, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? He said, absolutely. He says, well, how do you know? He says, because I'll have you know I keep the commandments. The man says, well, do you keep them all? He said, all ten. The preacher says, well, I'd have you know there are 513 commandments in the Old Testament. 513? He said, I want you to just tell me one commandment besides the ten. He says, okay, I'll do that. Deuteronomy chapter 6, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, 
And then, of course, not in chapter 6, but later on you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The man says, wait a minute. Nobody could keep that command. Nobody ever loved God with all their heart, soul, and mind. And he said, that's the exact point. Try as you might, you can't keep God's standard, but Jesus kept that standard. And that's why he came to save. This, this law is a condemnation law. It shows you that you're lost. It is a mirror to show you that you're condemned. But you see the contrast here, the ministration of death, how much more, how much superior is the ministration of the Spirit. That's the grace of God. You know what came with the gospel was not mere mercy, not just a way to temper the law, but it, the law was completely fulfilled. You see, even tempered with mercy, I have no hope, but what I need is the grace of God. You see, I'm just one prayer away. Moses prayed for those folks, but it wouldn't have been another week, and they'd have sinned again. But what we need is the grace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about this ministration. First of all, the scope of this message. You know, the law pretty well was aimed at the Jew. God didn't give the law to the whole world. Now they're responsible for it after they hear it, but he gave it to one group of people, not ever to save them. The law never did save anybody. He gave it to them to condemn them. So they would seek a savior. But what is the scope of the gospel? God didn't just give the gospel to one group of people to use as an illustration. The gospel is to the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, who would have all men to be saved and to come of the knowledge of the truth. Now, it doesn't matter today whether you're young, old, middle-aged, where you might be. It might be that you violated God's commandment. He says, thou shalt have no other gods before thee. And you've put things ahead of God. You, you're under his condemnation. Maybe you say, well, I don't really think I have any false gods. I mean, as far as I know, I, I think that God's important in my life. How about thou shalt not, or, or you shall honor your father and mother, that your days may be long upon the earth. Oh, well, there's a few times I blew it on that. only takes one time to blow it. How about thou shalt not bear false witness you tell one lie you're under the condemnation of God but you understand that Christ came to redeem us from that condemnation it wasn't just aimed at a group of people he aimed it to the world his his scope was to all that would come unto him all that would receive him as a matter of fact in John 1 11, it says he came unto his own and his own received him not but as many as received him that's anybody as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now the scope was superior. You also know that the, uh, the message itself is superior because how did the message of Jesus end? You know what the message of Jesus is? Let me give it to you in three English words, which was one word in the original. It is finished. When he died, yes, with the nails in his hand, and yes, with the blood flowing from his brow, and yes, with the, uh, eventually the spear coming in his side, all of those pointed to an outward sign that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from sin. But Jesus said, it is finished. It is done. Let me tell you, everything that has to be done today for you to be saved has been accomplished. All one have to do, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now, the ministration of glory, or the New Testament, the, the gospel, gives us soundness go back to the text in verse 12 here's his point seeing then that we have such hope you know hope can be used in a couple of different ways you could uh say hope with anticipation that it may not happen somebody says uh the kids say i sure hope it snows this week and actually accumulates and shuts down school again right that's hope May or may not. Down here, you got a better chance of it not than happening. But that's not this kind of hope. This kind of hope is an instilled hope. It's not based on if, it's based on because. I have hope that's been instilled because I know something. What do we know as a believer? Do you know I know today? I know that I'm going to heaven. Man, you must have kept up with things pretty close and Man, you, you must really feel like you live a good life. No, I think I fail quite often. If it depended on me, I'd have no hope. My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
He died for me. How could God lie? I have great boldness to say I'm going to heaven. Why? Because it's based on the works of another. It's based on the word of God. The world doesn't have that kind of plainness of speech. Listen, if you today remove Jesus from the equation, and I ask you if you know you're going to heaven, and immediately you started calculating your works. Have I given enough? Have I lived a good enough life? Have I done few enough sins? I mean, I'm not a drug addict, and I'm not a drunk, and I hadn't really killed anybody. But it doesn't no matter of what you didn't do. You've come short of the glory of God. You can't have any boldness of speech. But when you take your soul and then trust it in the Lord Jesus Christ, the question is not, are you good enough? The question is, is he faithful enough? Is he going to do what he says? He's a faithful God. The ministration is, is, is significant. This message that God gave us, this, this ministration that is given to us in this chapter, why does it give us boldness of speech? Well, because it's miraculous. It's supernatural. Now, very quickly, let me move on to the last point. We have boldness because, as it says here in the end, of a magnificent magnification. We magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. He shows the world who we are. Now, let me make it in simplistic terms before I read the text. Here's a person who's lost. They know they've come short of the glory of God. They know they've failed. They realize the Spirit of God shows them there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. Their sin has separated them from God. They see Jesus hanging on a cross, a cross, and they see him shedding his blood, and he came out of a grave, and they don't even understand it, but they think he's saying, come. He's saying, receive him. I'll do it. The moment they receive Jesus, Jesus takes up residence in their heart. That's why we say, ask him to come into your heart, because you're really opening it up to him. You can come live here. Jesus moves in in the person of the Holy Spirit and lives inside of you. But do you know what happens? When he moves inside, you become a new creature. He changes you completely inside. Now, the outside still hung on you. It's still got some old habits that need to go and some new thoughts that you need to have and some things that's got to learn, but there's a constant working inside, and it's God. He is the one that works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. He's the one that's fulfilling Ephesians 5, 26, of making us uh, become a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It is a constant uh, power that's inside. Now, you can hold it down. You can say, no, I'm going to hang on and I'm going to obey the flesh, and that hinders him from showing people who he is. But if you get out of the way and you yield to him, you don't come up with this. God produces it through you. You get out of the way, and he begins to show the world who he is. Look, if you would, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, seven, uh, chapter 3 and verse 17 it says now the Lord is that spirit he's who lives inside of you and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty you know a lost man looks at the Christian life unfortunately I think some Christians get confused about this too is a lost man looks at the Christian life and he says well hell's an awful place and boy it's, I sure don't want to go there so I guess if you don't want to go you basically just got to give up all the pleasures of this life and, and just kind of grin and bear it and say, well, I guess it'll just be worth it for all eternity to keep from having to go there. Now, it'd be worth anything to stay out of there because it's an awful place. To live with Jesus forever would be worth anything, but again, that's a misconception. You couldn't do that if you wanted to, and it wouldn't help you get to heaven. But they look at that as a drudgery, as, man, I'd have to put myself under bondage no, it's the opposite. That's the lie of the devil. You've never been as free as you are the day you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said in John 8, 34, whoso committeth sin is a servant of sin. Do you realize sin is a slave master? Like it or not, one of two things is controlling your life. Either your sin and self controls your life or God controls it. One of the others, the master, there aren't, there's nobody else to be the master. So a person is controlled by their sin, and it brings all kinds of problems in their life. Selfishness. They can't get along with folks. They try to fulfill the lust of the flesh through substance or whatever it might be, and it, it just pays them back physically. It pays them back in all types of family relationships or whether a job or in society. It just doesn't work. Why do they go back to it? Because they're a slave. Maybe it's even the person who says, well, I don't want to get destroyed with substance, but I'm going to climb the corporate ladder, and they step on people, and they're proud. Or somebody even says, well, I'm going to give a bunch of money to charity, but self keeps sticking its head up. The life of sin is a life of slavery. 
But Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. And he says, if you know the Son, he shall make you free indeed. The Spirit of the Lord moves inside, and now for the first time, I actually have liberty. Now, does that mean that a Christian now completely lives for his flesh with no consequence? No, I could do that before. That's the slavery. Now it means that God has liberated me from sin. I now have him living through me, the Christian life. And my job, if I have one, is to yield. Is simply to yield it to him. Romans 12 hits this same truth when it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Look at verse 18. But we all, with the open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, it says over in 1 John 3 that when we see him, when he comes, we're going to be like him, for we'll see him as he is. That's not that his, your hair color is going to be like his or your skin tone is going to be like his. That's not the point. You're going to be like him in his essence. And what he promotes, I, I, it's, it's, it's too limited to say just in his morals, and it's different than that. It's deeper. But you're going to be like him in who he is. So every day when I'm changed into his image, I'm yielding to him, and he makes me a little bit more like him. What was it like for Jesus to walk this earth? When, when people met Jesus, they knew this person is different. They knew this man is uh, not like a regular man. The soldiers went to capture him, and they came back, and the Pharisees, why didn't you capture him? Never a man spake like this man. I mean, Jesus impacted this world. But imagine now the Holy Ghost lives in all the believers. If we yielded our life and let Jesus live through what would make you think he wouldn't still impact the world just as much as he ever has? We can impact it. Now, we're changed into his image from glory to glory. So what hinders that from taking place? Well, it says, of course, be not conformed to this world, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, there's a lot of stuff that takes your mind control in this world, isn't there? You fill your life with rock and roll, and you fill your mind with the trash that Hollywood puts out, and you're constantly bombarded with all that your, uh, the people around you, co-workers, friends, and etc. All of this stuff comes into your mind. Some of it you have a choice to reject. Some of it we have no choice but to be exposed to. We, by our own choice, can say, well, God, I don't want, you, I don't want to be entertained like the world is because I don't want to be affected, but you're still going to be exposed to it. So from glory to glory, every day, I got to see him. There's only one way to find him. You find him when you communicate with him. You speak to him, and there's only one place he's going to speak to you. It's in this book. This book is the mirror. This book is the place. This is where you behold his face. This is where you find him. You say, well, how many hours a day or how many hours a week do you have to, to read the Bible to become changed into his image? There's no time limit. There's no parameter. It's a matter of seeking God. How much do I want to find him? Yes, the, the, the affairs of this life limit that. Wouldn't it be good that if I could get to a point to say, not how much time am I required to seek him to still get by, or I wonder how much I'll be able to put aside from all the affairs of this life and look forward to that wonderful time, how limited it might be, that I could get to know him. I mean, it's not just a matter of me sitting down at a desk and spending hours reading this book. That ain't a bad idea. But it's not practical to think that's going to happen. But it's a matter of when I do sit down, I make it part of me, and I let it take control of my decisions. I let it take control of my life. I think about him and let the Spirit of God take that truth. And it, does it happen overnight? No, that's why it's from glory to glory. We're changed little by little, bit by bit. We start getting out of the way, and Jesus starts showing the world what he looks like. What kind of impact could the world have made upon them today if Jesus really shines through and shows people who he is. I believe it'll be a great impact, and I hope God will give us a heart to do it. We have boldness today to speak.